from Seth Magaziner back to Brown. He was a Brown undergraduate, a history major, concentrator in the day, then went to the School of Management at Yale. Wait, are they not called concentrations anymore? They are called concentrations. <laughs> Sorry, I always forget. It's very few speakers who have the confidence to correct their introductions. <laughs> but that tells you what you need to know about Seth. He wins in a landslide, and I don't think anybody has taken the general treasurer's office and done as much with it in his first year. Um, this is a long list, the Green Infrastructure Initiative. You guys already know what it is. So rather than going through a long list and taking up time, let me just say the job you've done is wow. It's just exactly what we'd love to teach and read about and see, not just as uh, public policy teachers and students, but as citizens of Rhode Island. Seth, so thank you for all you're doing, and welcome back to Brown. Thank you. 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 Well, I'm gonna, I have no idea how this thing works, so I'm going to try to figure it out as I go. But um, uh, thank you uh, to Professor Marone, who um, you know was a, a rock star uh, 10 years ago when I was here and, and uh, continues to be today. Uh, thank you, uh, Ellen, for organizing. I don't know where you went, uh, but oh, there you are. And uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out. I, I want to recognize, um, in particular, uh, a few people. You know, Brown has been tremendously helpful to me as state treasurer, not just in the education I received here, although that was invaluable, uh, but also um, uh, a number of members of my team. I'm joined today uh, by Kelly Rogers, who's our Deputy Treasurer for Policy, very much involved in developing uh, the Infrastructure Bank and a graduate of the Master's Program uh, in Public Policy here at Brown. Uh, we've also had a number of uh, stellar uh, interns from Brown, including uh, Brenna Scully, who is uh, helping us uh, right now on a range of issues and uh, I think spends uh, more time working in the office probably than some of the uh, full-time staff uh, and has uh, been a tremendous contributor to our work. So uh, I was uh, invited to come and speak specifically about the Infrastructure Bank. What is it? What does it do? Why are we doing it? How did it come about? Um, so I think there's two parts to this that I'm going to try to weave together. The first is I am going to talk about the policy side of it. What is the Infrastructure Bank? What are we trying to accomplish? Where is it in the process of getting up and running? Uh, but then I'll also, you know, for those of you who are interested more in kind of the political and process side of things, try to weave in some stories uh, for uh, politically, how were we able to get this to happen, what got me interested in it, how do we get it passed, and kind of the ins and outs around that. So we have some slides here that I'm going to follow, not religiously, but uh, it will help keep me on track. Um, so I ran for treasurer because... I saw it as an office where you could impact a whole wide range of different policy areas. So, you know, finance and, and money kind of touches everything, right? So if you want to work on environmental issues, you can do that from the treasurer's office. If you want to work on education, you can do that from the treasurer's office. Um, I wanted to run for treasurer because I thought that there was tremendous opportunity to do more than just, like, write the checks and balance the books and really think creatively about ways that we could have, uh, use our position as a financial office to have an impact on a wide range of areas. So when I ran for treasurer, I put out a very detailed for a campaign document, 20 or so page long, uh, we call it the blueprint. Uh, the blueprint for Rhode Island, it was a kind of a big list of different ways that we were going to use the treasurer's office to help promote economic growth and economic justice and a whole range of different things that aren't typically associated with state treasurers. Um, and as we were writing the blueprint uh, back during the campaign, uh, it came up in conversation, hey, you know, there might be something to this green finance area. And it wasn't something that I had a tremendous amount of experience in, but my brother did. Uh, my brother, uh, who was also a Brown graduate, uh, he um, uh, was working in the clean energy space out in New York City. And so I called him up and I said, hey, you know, can you take a look and maybe write a few pages of, you know, this blueprint uh, on green finance for me? And uh, I come from a family of policy nerds. My father uh, was a policy nerd in the, in the Clinton White House and uh, worked on health care and trade and Internet policy there. 
Uh, a lot of our dinner table conversations tend to be very wonky. Uh, uh, they were when I was growing up, and they still are today. And so my, you know, uh, my father, myself, my brother, uh, we really love getting into the nuts and bolts of, uh, of policy. And so uh, my brother uh, sent me like a very long, detailed, footnoted set of ideas around green finance uh, to put in the blueprint, totally unusable as a campaign document because I couldn't understand what half of it said. So, you know, I remember we, you know, my brother, we went to a, uh, a McDonald's next to my campaign office and, you know, we sat down and he kind of explained it to me and walked me through it. And that was the beginning of how I became interested in using the treasurer's office to promote uh, sustainability and renewable energy and uh, uh, energy efficiency through the treasurer's office. So we put this blueprint out there. That was one whole section of it was devoted to green finance. Uh, very few people read it. It was, uh, it was an effective campaign tool, I would say, because in all of our commercials and everything, we said, we have a blueprint for Rhode Island and how we're going to use the treasurer's office to promote economic growth. And people would come up to me during the campaign all the time and say, oh, yeah, you know, that's great. You've got a blueprint. No idea what's in it, but it sounds good. The one person who did actually read it was President Clinton, also a policy nerd, right, um, at heart. He uh, came to campaign for me, and he actually got out of the car, and he had the blueprint in hand, and it was like underlined and margin notes, and uh, so that was kind of a neat moment. But then you have that moment where you're elected for the first time, you take office, you put a great team together, and you realize, all right, we said we were going to do lots of things. Like, are we actually going to be able to do them? Um, and the other thing that happened was, uh, you know, not only was I fortunate enough to be elected, uh, but we uh, elected a new governor, uh, Governor Raimondo, who in the infrastructure area had put out a lot of ideas similar to what I had put out during the campaign. She did a little differently. Hers, I would say, were on the infrastructure area, were broader. She was talking about roads and bridges and schools and all kinds of things. Mine was a little narrower and deeper, but there was a lot of overlap. So one of the first things that uh, I did after I took office is got together with, uh, with her and said, you know, in this infrastructure area, we seem to be wanting to do a lot of similar things. Um, let's work together and, you know, I think that our office should take the lead oh, hello. on at least one of these infrastructure areas. And, uh, you know, I volunteered that green finance Green infrastructure would be an area where I would love for our office to take a lead. She was very happy to have us do that. And we had a mutual understanding that um, at a gut level, even if we didn't know all the details yet of how it was going to work, if you are spending money on projects that will make our state more energy efficient, helping us save money on energy costs, there ought to be able to be a way to finance those things uh, by bringing private capital to the table. Because if you're creating financial savings, there ought to be a mechanism to get the private sector to help fund these projects so that you don't have to pay for all of it out of the budget, out of tax revenue. So this was during the transition period. Um, you know, in coordinating with the governor, we kind of agreed that green finance, some sort of a green bank, would be a major initiative of the treasurer's office in our first year and that we would do our very best to minimize the impact of the state budget um, by maximizing the role of private capital. So um, we started our work in January of last year. We had a very tight timetable because the legislative session in Rhode Island starts in January. The budget gets introduced in the first year of a term, uh, no later than March. And so we really only had two or three months to figure out from scratch how we were going to do this. I was very fortunate to have a great team, including Kelly, who has uh, an energy background, uh, in addition to the very valuable Brown Diploma. Um, and uh, we, I mean, put in a ton of time in the first couple months that I was in office on this. We were in on weekends. We were, you know, a lot of late nights just pouring through the information. And we identified um, a handful of key metrics that helped us define the problem. So Rhode Island uh, suffered and still continues to from an above average unemployment rate. A lot of Rhode Islanders out of work. There's a whole bunch of reasons for that. But to break it down very simply, we lost 40,000 jobs during the recession. At the time, 
last year when we were working on this, we had only gained 25,000 of those 40,000 jobs back. As we stand here today, we've gained back another 7,000. So we're still only about three quarters of the way out of the jobs hole. Um, in comparison, the country as a whole is more than 100% of the way out of the jobs hole nationally. Uh, Massachusetts is more than 200% of the way out of the hole. They've already added twice as many jobs as they lost during the recession. So we've really lagged. And if you break it down by industry, we've particularly lagged uh, in the building and construction trades. Uh, we lost 11,000 jobs in the construction trades. Uh, at this time last year, we had gained back fewer than 5,000 of those 11 that we lost. And uh, as we stand here today, a year later, we're still only at about 5,100 jobs regained relative to what we lost. Um, energy costs. We are at the end of the line in Rhode Island. We don't produce oil or gas or coal. We don't have large rivers for hydropower. Um, so we are at the end of the supply line. And as a result, our energy costs are among the highest in the country. At this time last year when we were looking at this, uh, for example, the price of electricity for commercial customers in Rhode Island, including Brown University, was the second highest of any state in the country after only Hawaii, right? Because we're at the end of the line. And, uh, you know, when you have those challenges, when you have high unemployment in the building and construction trades, you have high energy costs, the opportunity that presents itself is you invest in projects that will put people back to work, making the state more energy efficient. So we started by looking at what was working. And one agency that was kind of a sleepy agency, but a very important one that had existed in Rhode Island for the last 20 or so years was called the Clean Water Finance Agency. The Clean Water Finance Agency has been around for about 20 years and it floats bonds. As a government, state government entity, it can float bonds at a very low rate. Uh, it's tax exempt on the, um, uh, the interest to bondholders, so you can, exempt, you can issue bonds at a very low cost. And then the Clean Water Finance Agency would turn around take those proceeds and lend them to cities and towns to fix their sewers, to fix their storm drains for clean water and drinking water projects. It was low cost loans to cities and towns. This agency has been around for 20 years, AAA rated, has never had a single default. Um, every single loan that they've made to a city or town or other borrower has been paid back in full. Um, so that provided us with a foundation to add some new programs geared toward energy efficiency and renewable energy. So the proposal was this, start with the Clean Water Finance Agency, add some new programs. And we spent a lot of time looking at other states around the country that had done green finance. Uh, one of the best at this is actually Connecticut, the Connecticut Green Bank right next door. We went out to Hartford, we spent some time out there learning from them. We studied New York, we studied uh, the UK, we studied other states that were doing things in this area, and um, came up with a couple of ideas for new programs to add. One called the Efficient Buildings Fund, and one called the PACE program, Property Assessed Clean Energy. So the Efficient Buildings Fund is very simple. It is very much like the existing clean water and drinking water funds at the Clean Water Finance Agency low-cost loans to cities and towns to help them retrofit their buildings, their libraries, their schools, their firehouses, um, and not just buildings, but you know, a lot of cities are now interested in replacing their street lights with LED lights, uh, basically any kind of energy efficiency or renewable energy project, low-cost loans to cities and towns. Um, the second uh, is the PACE program, and this is based entirely off of something that has been very successful in Connecticut. It's the same concept, you're providing low-cost loans for energy efficiency, but instead of loaning it to cities and towns, you're loaning it to private property owners, commercial and residential. So let's go a little bit more in depth into each of these. Um, the Efficient Buildings Fund, uh, yeah. So the Efficient Buildings Fund, um, uh, as I said, loans to cities and towns. Uh, you can float a bond uh, just like we do with the drinking water and the clean water programs at Clean Water Finance to help capitalize this. But you can't really just float a bond from scratch, right? Um, you usually need to be able to put up some of your own money 
you know, as basically equity and as kind of a loss reserve in order for the bondholders to be willing to take the risk, right? Um, especially because bondholders aren't getting paid very much these days because rates are so low, uh, the bondholders need some extra security. And so that was one uh, challenge was, all right, we need to pull together at least a few million dollars uh, in order for us to be able to float our bond. Um, as we started looking around, uh, we found a few potential sources of funding. And the most interesting one was uh, we found not one, but two pools of money back from the old 2009 federal stimulus that had been earmarked for energy efficiency in Rhode Island and had never been used. Not one, but two different pools of funding from the 2009 federal stimulus. We found it because we were looking at how New York had gotten their Green Bank up and running, and they had used a lot of federal stimulus money of various types. And we kind of went, well, wow, like, the, how did Rhode Island use its funding? And we couldn't find anyone who had used one of its called, uh, uh, in particular, what's called QECB funding um, in Rhode Island. And it was literally, we were calling up, you know, different agencies around the state, like, did you use it? Did you use it? Did you use it? Nobody had. We checked with the federal delegation to, like, double and triple check. Um, there was money that was still available. Um, but we also realized that if we didn't use it soon, the federal government was going to come calling and take it back. Um, there's also something called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, uh, which uh, essentially is a series of uh, auctions where uh, power producers who are emitting more than a certain amount of uh, uh, carbon emissions uh, have to basically sell, buy and sell credits uh, through an auction process that raises money for uh, states in the Northeast and parts of Canada. And uh, that brings in a few million dollars uh, to Rhode Island every year. Uh, and those proceeds uh, were available. Uh, let me talk a little bit more about PACE. What is it? How does it work? Um, so PACE is a model that relies almost entirely on private capital. This is a good uh, example of bringing private funding into an energy efficiency program. Um, the way it works is banks or other lenders make the loans. They take the risk. Uh, they make the loans to private borrowers. But what makes it different than just an ordinary bank loan is that it is structured as a tax lien on the property. And that's important for a couple reasons. Uh, the first reason is uh, banks and other lenders like having that extra security because people are more likely to pay their, uh, their tax bills than they are um, you know, a normal energy efficiency loan. So it gives them that little bit of extra security which makes them comfortable with uh, offering more flexible terms on their loans, lower rates, or longer terms. Longer terms on a loan are especially important because if you can stretch out the term of the loan long enough, then your annual payments all become lower. So you can see net savings right away, right? So the saving, you've got the cost of your debt payment, you've got the savings of your energy bill uh, from the project. You want the savings in a given year to be larger than your debt payments. And by stretching out the term of the loan, it's more likely that you'll see those savings on a net basis up front. So banks and other lenders are more comfortable offering flexible terms uh, through a tax lien than they are through a, a regular loan. Uh, the other reason that it's important to do it through a tax lien is uh, then if the building is sold uh, and a new owner comes in, the loan stays with the building. Uh, so if you take out a PACE loan, you fix up your building, you sell and you move to Alaska, uh, the loan doesn't follow you. The loan stays with the building, and the new owner who inherits the lower energy costs or the higher property values also inherits the responsibility of paying off the balance of the loan. Um, so this is almost entirely financed through private capital. It's really just the legal tax lien mechanism that you put in place that uh, allows the whole thing to work. And then we did uh, create uh, a small loss reserve, um, uh, kind of an extra uh, little bit of risk sharing uh, with some of the federal stimulus funds that we found uh, to, again, help lower the rate uh, of the loans. So these charts here, and we can make these available to anybody who wants them, just kind of lays out, uh, as we envisioned, the sources of the funding for each program. Um, so in the Efficient Buildings Fund, uh, we're envisioning the first round being about $20 million worth of projects uh, funded at the city and town level. 
most of which will come from a bond that the infrastructure bank will float. Uh, uh, the cost offset somewhat by the federal stimulus funds and the regional greenhouse gas initiative proceeds. Uh, PACE, uh, uh, again, uh, almost entirely uh, funded through private capital, as is the case in Connecticut. Uh, but we are putting a couple million dollars of federal stimulus into that as well to help lower the cost of the borrowing. Um, all right, so let's back up and I'll kind of give a little context. So we scrambled to figure all this out in about a two-month time frame from January to March of last year. And we, you know, then marched upstairs with a presentation that looked very much like this one. Uh, Kelly and, and me and my chief of staff, Andrew, uh, on a snowy Saturday to uh, meet with the governor and, and her team and show them this and ask if they would include it in her budget. Uh, because even though uh, there was no money from the state budget going into this, um, we still felt that including it in the budget uh, uh, at, rather than as standalone legislation would increase the likelihood that it would get passed, right? We were brand new to the State House. I had never been in government before. Uh, taking a very complex plan that most people wouldn't read or understand and trying to get it passed as a standalone would have been much more difficult than getting the governor's support uh, for putting it in her budget as part of the package. So we marched upstairs. We presented it. Uh, you know, she and her team liked it very much. They especially liked the fact that we found a way to do all of this, not only with, you know, minimal budget impact, but actually no budget impact at all. Um, so they were happy with that. And then we had kind of a funny conversation where we said, well, you know, the Clean Water Finance Agency is going to be doing more than just clean water now. Well, what are we going to call this? And, uh, you know, we floated the idea of calling it a green bank, the Rhode Island Green Bank, just like the Connecticut Green Bank. And, uh, you know, the governor said, well, maybe we'll be doing other kinds of infrastructure, be, you know, besides green infrastructure in the future through this, so let's call it an infrastructure bank. And that's why the name is now the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank instead of the Clean Water Finance Agency or the Rhode Island Green Bank, which it almost was. Um, so what's the impact going to be? Um, Hard to say with PACE, right? Uh, because with PACE, there's no defined pool of capital. We're recruiting private lenders and private uh, property owners to participate in this program. But we can put together a rough idea based on what happened in Connecticut. Uh, in Connecticut, they do PACE for commercial properties only. They don't do it for residential. But as I said earlier, in Connecticut, just with commercial PACE, they average about $20 million of loans a year. So if you figure, we're about a third of the size of Connecticut population-wise. Um, uh, then uh, on top of that, we're going to be doing residential in addition to just commercial. You know, ballpark, once we're up and running, you know, four to eight million dollars uh, a year of projects through PACE, I think seems like a reasonable um, uh, estimate. The Efficient Buildings Fund, we are dealing with um, a defined pool of capital. Uh, this first round, uh, we think with the uh, $5 million of stimulus and Reggie proceeds that will allow us to do a bond of about another $15 million, so call it $20 million altogether for this initial round. Um, and then if you try to quantify the impact in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, emissions uh, or savings, um, the rule of thumb generally is that in the construction industry, every million dollars you spend is equal to about 20 job years, so 20 jobs per year. Uh, so, you know, in year one, we would project based on $20 million of projects from the Efficient Buildings Fund, another four or five, call it, from PACE. Uh, you're talking about um, uh, three to 400 jobs, uh, construction jobs in year one. Uh, the potential energy savings are also significant. A deep energy retrofit to a building, particularly an older building, can save 15 to 20 percent of the energy costs to the building. Um, could be very substantial, particularly to the cities and towns where we have a lot of old building stock. Um, you know, our school buildings are very old, our libraries, firehouses, etc. Um, so significant energy savings plus the upfront jobs benefit. Plus, you know, we're reducing our carbon footprint uh, and doing right by the environment. We are the ocean state, and so, um, you know, I think it's particularly important for us to be a leader in this area. Uh, so. Uh, it all went largely to plan. Um, uh, the governor did include the legislation in her budget in March of last year. Uh, our team, and in particular Kelly, worked very hard with uh, the House and Senate staff to make sure that they understood what we were trying to do. 
It was a very complex piece of legislation to set all of this up. It was about 80 pages long by the end of it. 80 pages, I guess, like for Washington, D.C., congressional legislation is very short, but in Rhode Island that's unusually long for a piece of legislation. So very much like the blueprint, I don't know how many people actually read it besides us, but, um, but the, the House and the Senate uh, staff in particular uh, spent a lot of time going through it. Uh, then you've got to go and sell it, right? Especially when it is a complex thing that not many people understand, uh, you need to show support and demonstrate support. Um, so we spent a lot of time last spring. And I should say also, you know, politically, we were all in on this last year. This was our one big piece of legislation um, in our first year in office. We were doing some other things around transparency and other non-legislative issues that, you know, would prove to be some good accomplishments for us. But, you know, as kind of the new kids on the block at the State House, showing that we could get a meaningful piece of legislation passed, like this was our thing. And so if it wasn't this, then we would have had to wait a year to try again on something else next year. So we spent a lot of time recruiting stakeholders to show up and show their support. Um, the great thing is, like, who could be against this, right? I mean, you know, you've got jobs, you've got lower cost of energy for businesses and homeowners, and you've got the environmental benefits. So we divided our stakeholder outreach into three parts, essentially. We had um, uh, the building trade and labor organizations uh, who liked the jobs. We had the environmental organizations who liked the environmental benefits. And then you had the uh, uh, energy customers, uh, both the business uh, 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 commercial customers and also the um, uh, the cities and towns. So this is um, the actual list that we used when we had our House and Senate hearings last spring of all the different stakeholders who at that time had signed letters uh, saying that they were supportive. It's not every day that you have the Chamber of Commerce, the AFL-CIO, and the environmental community all supporting the same piece of legislation. Um, but those were sort of the three legs to our stool. and. Uh, Article 24 was uh, uh, the part of the budget that the, uh, the governor's proposed budget that we had been uh, included in. Um, we had great uh, turnout uh, at both our House and Senate hearings, significant support, uh, no meaningful opposition. Um, the House, so the kind of the, the biggest uh, moment of suspense was uh, would we be included in the House? of representatives version of the budget. Because the way it works in Rhode Island is the governor proposes a budget, but it's just a proposal. Then you find out, you know, a couple of days before the budget vote what the final version from the House looks like. And uh, so we were kind of on pins and needles until the House version came out. They did include our 80-page article almost exactly word for word. Uh, for them, it was Article 14 instead of Article 24. Uh, and then it passed. It passed in June. Um, it passed. Not quite unanimously, but I, I chalked that up to, uh, you know, it was a complex piece of legislation that uh, was difficult to uh, educate people on. Uh, and it was signed into law in June. So, by the way, I have no idea how long I'm supposed to speak for. How am I doing? You're doing great. Okay. Five, I, ten minutes. All right. Let me, let me do a few. So let me talk. I'll just briefly touch on um, what's happened since then. Because, you know, I talked about the initial, like, oh God moment, which is you get elected and you realize you've got to figure out how to actually do, you know, all of these things that you promised you were going to do. Uh, then the second one is, great, we get this thing passed, now is it going to work, <laughs> right? Because um, how embarrassing would that be? So, uh, so here's the, uh, uh, what's happened. So we um, started in the summer putting together uh, a working group of different state agencies that would be involved in getting these new programs up and running because it wasn't just the Clean Water Finance Agency, now the Infrastructure Bank, um, that was going to be uh, involved. Uh, you also had our office. You had National Grid, which is uh, the state's only real uh, electric utility. We've got a second small one, but the um, uh, but National Grid would have to be a partner in all of this. The state has an Office of Energy Resources, which kind of broadly oversees all things energy-related. Uh, the uh, Commerce Corporation, uh, the old EDC, was going to have to be involved. The Department of Environmental Management was another one uh, that's not on here, but they were around the table. 
the Department of Business Regulation. There was a lot of different stakeholder agencies that had to be involved in crafting this. Um, so we started in the summer having what were initially some very disorganized <laughs> meetings with a whole lot of different uh, 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 policymakers and bureaucrats in the room trying to figure out how we were going to do all of this. Um, and the first step was anytime you have new programs, you've got to develop rules and regulations for how those programs are going to operate. Uh, so developing the rules and regulations was first step. Uh, we also realized that, you know, we're going to have some kind of an application process, particularly for the Efficient Buildings Fund for cities and towns. Is anybody going to apply if they don't know whether or not this is actually going to help them? Like, who's going to go through the trouble of, like, writing up a long application and getting all, you know, your contractors lined up and your, you know, Department of Public Works and whoever else is going to be involved if you don't actually know whether or not you're going to save any money on your energy bills? Um, so we uh, realized early on that key to getting uh, a stimulating demand for these new programs was going to be providing free energy audits. So the Infrastructure Bank had a little bit of um, uh, extra money available. We, uh, National Grid, um, uh, has a contractor that they use for energy audits. And so we were able to get agreement that basically uh, we would provide uh, 50 free energy audits uh, to cities and towns, uh, paid for uh, in part by the Infrastructure Bank, and then National Grid actually volunteered to uh, uh, help share that cost, which is a great example of kind of a good public-private uh, partnership. Uh, we provided the free energy audits to the cities and towns. We opened up the application period. And for a $20 million round of funding, we got $60 million worth of applications from the cities and towns. So the demand has been really strong. 27 of Rhode Island's uh, 39 communities applied for funding. Uh, we're now in the process of um, doing some final vetting on the applications. We won't be able to uh, uh, meet all of them uh, because we don't have the funding for this first round. Uh, but we're finalizing the, um, the, the list of which projects are going to move forward. And it's a really good mix of projects that we got through the application process. It's um, you know everything from wind turbines in West Warwick to uh, rooftop solar on schools in uh, Pawtucket to uh, uh, new streetlights in uh, Woonsocket. It's a really good mix of different kinds of projects, of different kinds of borrowing communities, um, urban and suburban. Uh, so it's a really strong list of applicants. Uh, and uh, we're on track to um, uh, uh, get this round of funding out the door uh, in June or July of this year uh, so that we will you know, have shovels in the ground uh, uh, this summer. And then we'll turn our attention to figuring out uh, uh, how we're going to build on this success and uh, put together a second round uh, for the Efficient Buildings Fund in 2017. Uh, for PACE, um, we ran into, um, uh, well, a couple of things. First is, uh, for commercial PACE, uh, we had the benefit, again, of having Connecticut right next door who has done this and has the most successful PACE program in the country. So we can take a lot of pages out of their playbook. And we partnered with uh, a third-party firm called uh, Sustainable Real Estate Solutions uh, to help us get this off the ground, the same administrator that works with Connecticut on their PACE program. PACE, more than the Efficient Buildings Fund, is a departure from what the Clean Water Finance Agency had done in the past, because this is the first time that the now Infrastructure Bank is going to be lending to private borrowers and not just to cities and towns. So it's a totally different type of marketing, a totally different type of underwriting, a totally different type of outreach that has to happen, uh, which is why the decision was made to partner with uh, this firm that has expertise and can help us think through all of this. Um, you know, as far as the marketing goes, uh, what they found in Connecticut, and what's interesting, is that the best marketing uh, sales force uh, for PACE loans is building contractors. Um, because they already have relationships with, you know, large building owners around the state. They're doing other kinds of work for them, and so they're the best ones out there to say, hey, by the way, if you want to do solar panels, there's this great new low-cost way for you to fund it. So uh, one of the things that's going to be happening in the next couple months is we're going to be doing a bunch of information sessions with contractors to teach them about this, because 
uh, we feel that here in Rhode Island, as in Connecticut, they will be the most uh, effective sales force. Um, and we are on track for commercial pace uh, to be launched uh, also this summer. Um, I should say just uh, briefly before I wrap up, um, residential pace uh, has turned out to be trickier than commercial. And there's a reason that Connecticut does commercial and not residential. Uh, the reason is uh, because of those tax liens and uh, how do they interact with mortgages, right? So for commercial PACE, you can make a PACE lien senior to the mortgage as long as the mortgage lender signs off on it, which, believe it or not, in Connecticut hasn't really been a problem. Um, you can't do that with residential PACE because of Fannie and Freddie regulations. Mm -hmm. So a mortgage lender, even if the lender, even if the bank that made the mortgage loan is okay with having that loan become junior to a PACE loan, um, uh, if they want to turn around and sell those loans to Fannie and Freddie, which is where, what, like 80% of mortgages end up, um, Fannie and Freddie right now won't allow that. So that's a snag that we've hit in residential pace that we knew about going in, uh, but we figured that we would legislate it, we would put it on the books, and then we would join other states in advocating that the federal government change its policies to allow residential pace to move forward more effectively. Um, and if and when uh, the federal government does make that change, we will be ready to, uh, 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 to take action and to get residential pace up and running. So um, I hope that this was helpful. I know a room full of fellow nerds when I see one. So you know this is uh, a little bit in the weeds. But um, I wanted to get across why we did this, the problems we were trying to solve, how exactly these new programs are going to work, how we funded them, what they're going to do. The timeline, which is um, it's exciting. I mean, for us, you know, as newcomers, uh, to see this come from, you know, brainstorming a year ago to legislation to getting it passed to the implementation process, and now we're so close, just a month or two away from actually having uh, people working on projects across the state. It's very exciting. And in terms of what comes next, a um, couple of things. I mean, the first is uh, pace. Uh, ought to be uh, a sustainable system in the long run. The Efficient Buildings Fund, if we're going to do additional rounds, we need to find additional funding. Um, not necessarily a lot. Remember, for this first round, we were able to take essentially $5 million of REGI and federal stimulus money and use that to raise another $15 million of capital from bondholders. So, you know, if we wanted to do another 20 or 30 or $40 million round, we wouldn't need to find 20 or 30 or $40 million. Um, but uh, finding a way that we can make the Efficient Buildings Fund sustainable financially so that we're not every year kind of scrambling to figure out how we're going to pull the money together is a big agenda item for us uh, in the coming months. And then, you know, back to that conversation that we had with, with the governor and her people about what to name this agency uh, and this notion that it really can do more in the future than just water or just alternative energy and energy efficiency projects, uh, what comes next for the infrastructure bank? And we've already started to brainstorm and think about other things. Um, one that uh, uh, has come up that we've um, been discussing a little uh, is uh, uh, climate change adaptation. Uh, as the ocean state, as a low-lying coastal series of communities um, that are particularly uh, uh, prone to flooding and, and vulnerable to extreme weather events. Um, maybe there are ways that we can use the infrastructure bank to help promote uh, development of, you know, whether it's sand dunes or seawalls or uh, other types of um, uh, uh, defenses against flooding uh, is something that we've started to think about. And I'll just say kind of provocatively and leave it out there, um, continuing with the theme of bringing private capital to the table, uh, the insurance industry really ought to have uh, some incentive uh, to help us uh, with programs that will protect their investment and guard against uh, extreme weather events and flooding. So this is still just very much in the brainstorming phase, and uh, you know we'll see what comes next. But I do think that there is a, a future for the infrastructure bank beyond what we have done already. So 
I hope this was helpful. I'm glad that I didn't put anybody to sleep. Um, but uh, I, I really appreciate you all having me here today. So the go question and answer. Ellen has a microphone. I know you don't need the microphone to hear ourselves, but we're taping this. So, um, so speak into the microphone. We're going to go with it. That's another. Uh, no, you've got questions behind you. Hi, I, uh, well, I'm not a finance person, so one, I'm just going to uh, uh, speak back what you just said, so I know that I've understood it right, and then I have... Could you speak up or speak into the microphone, please? Okay. Um, I said that I'll just speak back what you said, so I, I'm sure that I understood it right, and uh, the second is that I do have a couple of queries that I'm going to ask you. Um, and I'm particularly interested in this because I come from India and I think this might, this is just what is needed, I think, in different parts of the globe. So uh, the first is, I don't really understand what a tax lien means. But what I sort of guessed is that, I, I don't know, I think what it means, okay, maybe you could just tell me that. Sure. So, um, so uh, it's basically a tax that is charged by the municipality because in Rhode Island, it's the municipalities that charge property taxes. Um, so it would be an additional tax. You would get a tax bill from the city of Providence or the city of Warwick, just like you get on your regular property tax bill. But then the municipality would collect that funding and repay it to the lender of the PACE loan. So it's essentially a, a, a tax on the property. Um, but uh, uh, the municipality isn't keeping the money, they're just using it as a mechanism to collect it and repay the lender. Yeah. Um, on that question, I wasn't clear to me. Is the lien only, or the surcharge, only for the residents of the buildings that have benefited from the investment, or is it a general surcharge on the entire jurisdiction? No, no, it would be specific to the property. And actually, that's, I mean, one of the challenges, um, so let me say two things. First, um, the municipality has to opt into this, right? And we've been doing a lot of outreach uh, with the uh, tax assessors and the um, uh, tax collectors of the different municipalities so that they understand what this would entail. Uh, and we're um, uh, actually helping them out with some software and other things to make it very easy for the municipality so there's really no cost or burden for them to do it. And then, yeah, the, um, the assessment, the tax essentially, is just on the property that has taken out the loan to do the improvement. And, um, you know, one of the challenges with PACE and with energy efficiency finance in general is that makes multi-tenant housing very difficult because if you have a multi-tenant unit where, you know, the tenants are paying the heat and electric bills, and the building owner doesn't really have much incentive to, uh, to do anything about it. And so when I talk about looking forward, other things that we might try to tackle in the future, that's another one that we're going to look at. I think, um, you know, pace really works best uh, when you just have a, you know, a single uh, occupant in the building. That's right. And now the question. You know, you said that uh, there wasn't very much trouble uh, getting the, um, what do you call the legislature to... Mm -hmm agree to your plan. I find that very surprising because uh, I, when, I, when I think of the political system, uh, they would have other, you know, they'd say that the same money or the same plan should actually be floated for roads or for replacing water pipelines or for, you know, for other infrastructures and not this. So my question is, did this get passed because it was called the infrastructure fund, <laughs> or did it get passed for the um, green green energy? Bill? Well, I think it was very important that um, because we didn't need any money out of the budget, we weren't competing with other priorities. So the federal stimulus funding that we used could only be used for energy efficiency. That was a federal requirement. The regional greenhouse gas initiative proceeds, again, could only be used for energy efficiency. That was in the law. And so, you know, you could argue that we were competing against other green or energy efficiency ideas that might be out there. But 
um, we weren't competing against funding for schools or roads or things like that. And so I think that made it easier uh, to get it through. Yeah. Uh, you and me? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm involved in the redevelopment process in Providence uh, with the I-195 Commission. And I wondered whether, under any sort of circumstances, the PACE program would be available for buildings that, if you will, um, uh, improve as they're constructed, have a greater level of improvements for energy efficiency than would otherwise be required by code. So the question is whether PACE could be applied to new build construction as right. opposed to just retrofits? Yes. I think it could. Um, I think it, you know, depends on the willingness of, again, it always depends on the willingness of the lender to make the loan. But I think in terms of the regulations that we pass for PACE, it does uh, in allow for PACE loans to be used for new build as well. Okay. I'll okay. give you another one, too. Um, uh, the Efficient Buildings Fund, I said it's for cities and towns, and the first round of applications we got was uh, entirely from cities and towns. But in the legislation, we actually made quasi-public agencies um, eligible as well. So I don't know um, what impact that could have or what application that could have for the 195 Commission, but, you know, theoretically, the Commerce Corporation could get access to funding from a future Efficient Buildings Fund round or, you know, just like the airport or the universities or other quasi-public agencies of the state. So we can talk about this offline. Okay, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, um, about the Efficient Building Fund, in theory, there should be a rate of return on the energy savings with the efficiency. <laughs> is, is that not a future viable source of some revolving fund at, at the moment? What is the... Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, so the question is, essentially, as I understand it, um, could the, you make the Efficient Buildings Fund sustainable by having it revolve, right, by saying, basically, after the cities and towns pay the infrastructure bank back and maybe at a uh, rate higher than the cost of the bond that funded the Efficient Buildings Fund, could you use those excess proceeds to do another round of funding? Um, at the $20 million level, you can have it revolve to some extent, but probably not enough for it to become fully sustainable. Um, so I guess the answer is half yes. I think that we can, you know, do it to some extent. I mean, the other thing, too, is we're learning as we go, right? So we don't know how high a rate we can charge to the cities and towns before they decide that it's not worth it or before they're able to find another alternative. So we're kind of trying to figure that out. But yeah, potentially some of the Efficient Buildings Fund could revolve over time um, and we could charge cities and towns uh, rates higher than the infrastructure bank's cost of capital potentially, but we're trying to figure that out. Just, uh, but is the mechanism now for issuing the loans, monitoring the payments, and monitoring the savings equipped to be able to give you some ground information about the the? Oh yeah, so um, we have pretty substantial reporting requirements, you know, for the number of jobs or the energy savings relative to expectations. Um, so we want to be able to measure and show you know, the impact as, as we do these projects. Yeah. How are you? So uh, two quick questions. Um, almost every time I look at a state funding opportunity, all of the recipients are white. Slater Fund, I can name you all ten. And I always think it's disgusting in a state 24 percent people of color that white folks get all the money. And the white folks who get all the money are those white folks. You know, very seldom did any middle-income white folks get anything, and low-income white folks don't get anything. So is, will there be an effort? And then part two of that, you just talked about uh, construction firms and the like. Mm -hmm. Again, will there be an effort there to invite the Latino and the black contractors yeah. to be real partners, not, you know, a quick moment. Right. Absolutely. So a couple of things. Um, uh, for the Efficient Buildings Fund, the um, infrastructure bank doesn't choose who does the work. It's the cities and towns of the borrowers who do. But that being said, um, 
I'm very pleased that uh, uh, all of, I believe, all of Rhode Island's majority minority communities applied for efficient buildings fund funding and are likely to get it. We haven't finalized the list yet, but you know, Central Falls, Pawtucket, Providence are all pretty high on the project priority list. In terms of the contractors, uh, for PACE, yeah, absolutely. When we're training contractors and letting them know how PACE works so that they can be the sales force for PACE loans, we'll make sure that um, you know, we work with the Latino Contractors Association, uh, uh, the Black Contractors Association, uh, organizations that I've worked with on other things in the past. Um, to make sure that they're getting that training too so that they can go out and be talking about and participating in PACE loans just like uh, anybody else. The, um, you know, the decision of who does the work for the Efficient Buildings Fund, however, uh, is made at the municipal level. So, you know, I would hope that our cities and towns do a good job of enforcing whatever standards they have. Um, I know that that's not always the case in reality, but uh, we can certainly encourage them to do so. Hi, yeah, I have a very quick question, which is, what percentage of your job is devoted to this, and what do you do the other percentage of your job? Oh, this is supposed to be a quick one. Um, I would say it's probably 10% of my job, and I don't know, 25% of Kelly's at this point. 40. 40. <laughs> it, 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 it ebbs and flows. I mean, back when we were trying to get it passed, it was obviously a larger percent. I mean. I would say I spend 40% of my time on the day-to-day -day operational management of the office. I mean, I manage a little bureaucracy of like 85 people, and we manage a few different programs. I spend about 40% of my time on that, 40% of my time on what I would call new initiatives and new ideas, including the infrastructure bank, and we've got a bunch of other bills we're trying to get passed this year that you know I'll talk about another time, and then 20% of my time politicking, basically out at events and, and, you know, ribbon cuttings and that sort of thing. Um, so as far as the part of the operational part of the job, our office manages a few significant programs. We manage the state's retirement system, the pension fund. Um, that's the primary source of retirement for 60,000 teachers, state workers, firefighters, police officers across the state. We manage the college bound fund, which is a 529 college savings program that has about a quarter of a million accounts and seven billion dollars of assets under management. It helps provide a tax efficient way for Rhode Islanders and, and others to save for college. Um, we manage a crime victims compensation fund, an unclaimed property program. So we've got a handful of programmatic things that we do. And then I'll, I know I'm supposed to be quick, so uh, in terms of other legislation we're working on very quick, a big focus of ours right now has been um, uh, debt management and debt reform. There are over a hundred different entities in Rhode Island with the authority to issue bonds, often with very little oversight. And so that's something that we're spending a lot of time on now is trying to uh, strengthen the oversight and management of, of public debt in the state generally. So that gives you a flavor of some of what we do. Last question. Good. All right, if I may. Um, as for next steps, this ties into the, the answer that you just gave to that question as well. I'm wondering if you're looking to take clean finance across other asset classes and maybe into the pension fund or the yeah. college fund as well? So, so actually we already are. Um, we've uh, done a couple things. So um, in the college bound fund, and just a real quick uh, primer, so uh, 49 states around the country offer 529 plans like the college bound fund, but you can market them nationally so all the states compete with each other. Of the quarter million accounts that we have, more than 90% are from out of state. There are twice as many Californians with Rhode Island College Bound Fund accounts as there are Rhode Islanders. Um, we did add a uh, fossil fuel free uh, investment option to the College Bound Fund. Um, it works like a 401k where you go in and you can kind of pick from a bunch of different options. Each participant can. So we were the first state in the country, I believe, to offer that. Um, and I think that it's something that will help us maintain a good competitive advantage uh, relative to our competitor states. And then we also have a similar uh, option in the pension system, the defined contribution part of the pension system, which is one where uh, the um, uh, cities and towns, I'm sorry, cities and towns, the uh, members of the pension system have the opportunity to make that choice. And then real quick vote. Other thing that we're doing is we're suing some companies. Um, <laughs> 
there are some uh, uh, fossil fuel companies out there, uh, specifically BP and Plains All American, uh, that had pipeline spills, where they represented to their investors and to others that they were doing everything that they were supposed to be doing to maintain these pipelines. They, in fact, were not. They had two significant spills, one uh, uh, in California and one in Alaska. The stock prices dropped. Shareholders lost money, including us. And so we're taking legal action with the aim of recouping some of those losses, but also, I think, sending a message, frankly, that um, not just in the energy industry, but all of our companies should be doing the responsible thing and not making misrepresentations to their shareholders. So there's a lot of different ways from this office that I think you can have an impact on environmental policy. So that's just a few of the things that we're doing. I can tell I've run over. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day.